Well, as I said, good morning, and welcome to Bethel Bible Fellowship. If you're a visitor with us, then we want you to feel welcome and know that we're studying in Mark. Um, we began uh, looking at Mark a few weeks ago, a couple months actually, and we'll continue again in Mark for uh, over a year uh, to get through this wonderful book. So Mark chapter 2, verses 18 to 22, that's our text for today. The gospel of Jesus Christ is matchless. It's unique. And it's exclusive. It cannot coexist with any other religious system. Just like water can't be mixed with poison and still be safe to drink, so the water of life by faith in Jesus Christ cannot be mixed with error and still retain its saving power. The world doesn't like this idea. And those who preach its truth are becoming less and less tolerable in the face of the religious diversity and relativism and ecumenism that are celebrated by the leading thinkers of our day. One of the key features of the last days that are recorded or spoken about by John in the Revelation is this unifying movement of the final embodiment of the religions of man. All the religions will be embraced into a worldwide movement which John called Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots, and of the Abominations of the Earth. Bless you. A harlot. A harlot in comparison with the church, the Bride of Christ. Revelation 17, 14 tells us that these, those in this one world religious movement, will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them because He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. The gospel of Jesus Christ is absolutely exclusive. Jesus was very adamant about this, and He made it very clear in John 14, 6, when He said, I am the way the truth, and the life. And notice the definite articles. I am the way and the truth and the life. And to make it stronger and more clear, he followed by saying, no one comes to the Father but through me. If you have a problem with the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, take it up with him. The Apostle Peter echoed Jesus' declaration in, John, in Acts 4.12, where in his first sermon after Pentecost, he said, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And many other biblical texts, including our text for today, underscore the exclusivity of Jesus' gospel. In Mark 2, 18 to 22, which we'll read in a moment, we have a clear statement of the narrowness of the gospel. In these verses, Jesus contrasts his gospel specifically with the apostate, legalistic Judaism of his day, and then by extension to every other false religion around the world and throughout the ages. The Pharisees who were Israel's prime religious leaders of Jesus' day, embraced a religion of external separation and superficial holiness. They would never associate with tax gatherers like Matthew, or touch a leper, or talk to an immoral half-breed adulteress like the woman at the well. But that's what Jesus did. He ignored the stereotypes, and he reached out to the outcasts of Jewish society. And he said, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. 
And shortly after this, Jesus declared that he had authority to forgive sins, and then he called Matthew a tax gatherer to be his follower, and then he demonstrated his eagerness to reach sinners by going to a dinner party at Matthew's house to eat dinner uh, with all of Matthew's sinning friends. Jesus made it crystal clear that his gospel was diametrically opposed to everything that the Pharisees and the scribes represented. They proclaimed a way of salvation through self-righteous effort and legalistic works. Jesus focused on God's grace, being granted to those who believed in him, who humbly cried out for mercy and who repented from sin. Jesus', was, Jesus message was rejected by those who self-righteously assumed that they didn't need it, but it was readily received by the ones who knew that they were sinners. Now that should speak to us today. If you think you're okay, if you think you have some merit in God's eyes, if you think you have something that's special about you that will make you acceptable to him, that puts you in the camp of the Pharisees. But if, on the other hand, you know you're broken and messed up and a sinner, then you are a prime candidate for Jesus. It's on the heels of Jesus eating with sinners that he explained just how incompatible his gospel was with the legalism of apostate Judaism. And, as I said a moment ago, by extension, with any system of works-based religion, whether it's man-generated or demon-spawned. Today's passage contains three simple points, three simple outline points. In verse 18 is the question. In verses 19 and 20, Jesus gives his answer. And in verses 20 and 21, 21 and 22, he gives uh, two analogies or parables or examples. So let's read our passage. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And they came to Jesus and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, While the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom do not fast, do they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear results. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and the skins as well. But one puts new wine into new wineskins. Well, I I have a quick question. Why were the disciples of John confronting Jesus alongside the Pharisees? Why were they with the Pharisees? What's up with that? Well, in my reading and thinking, I, I came up with three possibilities. First, it's possible that they were simply ignorant that Jesus was the Christ that John foretold. They just didn't know. They might have not been present at Jesus' baptism or heard John's proclamation about Jesus that he was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That happened in a specific moment in time, and John had preached to people from all over Judea over a longer period of time. And perhaps these people had responded to his preaching earlier, but returned home without hearing the rest of the story about Jesus. We know this is possible, this ignorance about Jesus in John's disciples. We know that it's possible because 30 years later, Paul, and this is recorded in Acts 19, verses 1 through 7, Paul met some disciples of John who didn't have the full story about Jesus or the Holy Spirit. Thirty years later. So that's one possibility. They just didn't know yet. 
A second possibility is that they were jealous of Jesus. John didn't feel this way. Because in John chapter 3, verse 30, he said about Jesus, he must increase and I must decrease. But these disciples of John may have been less enthusiastic about Jesus' increasing popularity. It's possible. A third possibility, well, either way, either way, John was in prison at this time, and he couldn't correct their misguided ignorance or their misplaced zeal. A third possibility is that because John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, though it did not save, it would certainly have stirred up one's spiritual expectation of the coming Messiah, and having been baptized by John, his disciples returned to their homes, more attuned to spiritual issues, like fasting. And because of that, they may have gravitated toward those who, at least outwardly, had appeared religious, like the scribes and Pharisees. So whatever the reason, both John's disciples, and by the way, in Luke's account, only John's disciples are mentioned asking this question. And in Matthew's account, only the Pharisees are mentioned. Here in Mark, both are mentioned. But whatever the reason, both John's disciples and the Pharisees question Jesus about fasting. One question may have been legitimate, the other may have been illegitimate or accusatory or attacking. We're not sure. The question was, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And we have Jesus' answer starting in verse 19. And Jesus said to them, while the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom do not fast, do they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. First, a little background. Fasting and prayer and giving alms or giving uh, money at the temple so that it could be given to poor people, almsgiving, charity, we might call it today, These three things were common expressions of piety in Judaism. And for the Pharisees, they were all spectator sports. They were performed pub publicly. Like, remember Jesus sitting at the door of the temple and the Pharisees came by and they threw their money into this. They had a brass horn that would funnel the money down into the coffers and they'd throw the coins in and they would make a lot of racket and noise and then the widow came and put in her two cents. That's the scenario for almsgiving. And that's the way the Pharisees like to flaunt their giving. Jesus confronted their superficial spirituality on the Sermon on the Mount, where he said that these things were to be done secretly, to honor God and not to impress people. And he addressed all three of them, prayer, praying publicly, almsgiving, fasting. They were to be done privately, secretly, not letting other people know so that it could be an issue between you and God and not for display or for impressing people. But the frequent and publicly flaunted fasting of the Pharisees became a favorite. Now, Mosaic law required fasting one time a year. That's it. On the Day of Atonement. One time. But the Pharisees fasted, get this, every Monday and Thursday. So, one time a year versus a hundred plus times a year. That's how huge the burden was that the Pharisees had laid upon the people and themselves so that they could make sure that they obeyed the law. They had morphed the religion into something totally different. Now, to be fair, in the Old Testament, there are several voluntary fasts that are mentioned. David fasted. Ezra and Nehemiah fasted as they came back from Babylon and they set up uh, the government and, and in, in Jerusalem again. Esther fasted when she called the people to fast for God's protection so they wouldn't be destroyed. These fasts are associated with um, grief and sorrow over sin 
or urgent pursuit of communion with God, or urgent requests for God's help. But fast motivated by proud, self-righteous, or callous ritualism were completely rejected by God. And we see that in Isaiah 58, where there's a conversation that's recorded, so to speak, between the people and God. And the people ask this question, why, why have we fasted and thou hast not seen? So there's a problem, right? They're not getting their answer. Why have we humbled ourselves and you don't notice? That's the question. So God answers. Behold, on the day of your fast, you find your desire and drive hard all your workers. Behold, you fast for contention and strife and to strike with a wicked fist. You do not fast like you do today to make your voice heard on high. And then Isaiah goes on to describe what God wants in a true fast. What's legitimate, heartfelt, broken, and so on. The Pharisees had added their own superficial superstructure to God's law. And here in the question they had asked, we see that they were upset, not because Jesus' disciples disobeyed God's law, but because they didn't follow their man-made traditions. Do you see that? Now notice, Jesus didn't back down. He didn't shy away from the conflict, and he didn't apologize for offending their man-made rules. Instead, he elevated the conflict so that he could inform John's disciples of who he was and expose the spiritual condition of the Pharisees. For John's disciples, his answer fulfilled their ignorance, if that was their problem, and it explained to them that he was the Messiah. At the same time, his answer confronted the indignation of the Pharisees the Pharisees accused Jesus of violating the rules and rituals of their legalistic apostate brand of Judaism. But Jesus pointed out to them that they had, in fact, set themselves against God's Messiah and God's plan of salvation. If they had recognized Jesus as the Messiah, they never would have questioned him like this in the first place. Jesus' rhetorical question while the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom do not fast, do they? That question underscored an incontrovertible spiritual truth. Fasting was for times of sorrow, solemnity, or seeking God. But a wedding was a joyful and festive event. The groomsmen, or children of the bride's chamber, if you have King James, were responsible for executing the wedding plans. For them, to fast at a wedding celebration would be inappropriate and insulting. Jesus emphatically stated at the end of verse 19, you see it there, so long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Can't happen. For groomsmen to mourn at a wedding party, I mean, can you imagine it? <laughs> How incongruous. It would be rude. It'd be ridiculous. So it was equally ludicrous to think that Jesus' disciples would fast and grieve when the Messiah was present with them. Jesus used the anticipation and joy of a wedding to illustrate the joy that sh should surround his presence as the Messiah. In the Old Testament, Israel was referred to the bride of the Lord. For example, in Hosea 2, 19 and 20, Hosea quotes God as saying, I will betroth you, speaking to Israel, to me forever. <coughs> Pardon me. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and loving kindness and compassion, and I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, then you will know the Lord. Jesus was enriching that imagery by referring to himself as the bridegroom. And Paul developed it further in Ephesians chapter 5, didn't he? Where he described 
the marriage between Christ and the church. By identifying himself as the bridegroom, Jesus is identifying himself as the Messiah, the sent one from God. Then we see that Jesus' statement, comparing the joy of the wedding feast to his presence with the disciples, uh, ends in a dark note. In verse 20 it says, But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, the disciples, and then they will fast in that day. Jesus said that the disciples' joy would end when the bridegroom would be taken away unexpectedly. That verb, taken away, literally means um, snatched away. It refers to a sudden and violent removal. This is a clear reference by Jesus to his upcoming crucifixion. Jesus said that his disciples would fast in that day. There was great sadness among them, which three days later was replaced with joy as they observed that he raised from the dead. But from that time on, with the bridegroom gone to heaven and the wedding not consummated, then his disciples did voluntarily fast. For example, in Acts 14, excuse me, Acts 13, the church leaders at Antioch fasted and prayed and the Holy Spirit then gave them instruction to set aside Paul and Barnabas to go on the first missionary journey. And then in Acts 14, Paul prayed at, when he was at every church when he was appointing elders for those various churches that he had planted. Now, all of this said about fasting and so on, Jesus pointed out to the Pharisees this simple truth. Their brand of legalistic self-righteous Judaism, which was a corruption of true Judaism, their brand of Judaism was completely out of touch, out of step with God's plan of salvation. They were ostentatiously mourning and fasting when they should have been rejoicing. They rejected Jesus, the Savior, and clung to their own rules and regulations. They were consumed with self-righteousness while Jesus offered grace Undeserved favor. They denied that they were sinners while Jesus preached repentance from sin. They were proud of their religiosity and Jesus preached humility. They embraced ceremony and tradition while Jesus preached a transformed heart. They loved the applause of men and Jesus offered the approval of God. They had dead ritual. He offered dynamic relationship. They promoted a system. He provided salvation. Now, following their question, why aren't your disciples fasting? And Jesus' answer, because I'm here and you totally missed it, Jesus follows up with two analogies. Let's read them again. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear results, number one. Number two, and no one puts new wine in old wineskins, otherwise the wineskins will burst and the wine is lost and the skins as well, but one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. These parables or examples illustrate just how incompatible the Pharisees' works-based religion was with Jesus' presence and with his gospel of grace. And by extension, as we've said earlier, we learn that according to Jesus himself, the gospel of salvation by grace through faith in him is completely incompatible with any system of works-based righteousness. Whether it's something that's completely opposite of Christianity or whether it is those cults inside the pale of Christendom that deny salvation by grace through faith. And there are several. All of those, his salvation, his plan of salvation is completely incompatible with those. Now, both these analogies have the same general point. Jesus' new gospel of grace cannot be mixed with the old works-based teachings of Pharisaic Judaism. In the first example, 
Jesus refers to the fact that an unshrunk piece of cloth can't be sewn as a patch onto an old garment. Is anybody here old enough to remember patching clothes? Can, can you re- do you know what he's talking about here? That if you take a patch of new denim, that's the best way to exemplify it, and put it on a pair of old Levi's, and then you wash it, then the patch shrinks and tears the Levi's. Which, I guess, is not a bad thing, because then that's kind of cool today, and you have your, like, shredded pants, whatever. But that's not, that's not what uh, you'd want in, in normal life. You don't put an old patch, a new patch, onto old Levi's. First of all, the, first of all, the colors wouldn't match. <laughs> we couldn't have that. But the new patch would shrink and tear out the old garment, and the state of the garment in the end would be worse than it was in the beginning. Jesus' point that his gospel of repentance and forgiveness of sin could not be patched into the legalistic traditionalism of Pharisaic Judaism. The true gospel could not be successfully attached to a tattered garment of a superficial religious religion worn so proudly by the Pharisees of that day. Apostate Judaism's rituals and ceremonies were beyond repair, and Jesus did not come with a message to patch up their old system. He came to totally replace it. Now, before we go on, We must note that the old garment that Jesus is referring to here is not the Mosaic law. And it is not the Old Testament as a whole. And it is not legitimate Judaism that he's attacking. He's attacking apostate Judaism. Jesus did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He made that clear in the Sermon on the Mount, didn't he? He said there in Matthew 5, 17... Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And Paul explained that the law is good. In Romans 7, 16, he said, I agree with the law, confessing that it is good. But through the centuries, the Jewish leaders had added their own stipulations and traditions to the law of God to the degree that Judaism was no, had more to do with... Um, uh, the strenuous and strict keeping of extra-biblical commands instead of honoring divine requirements. In Jesus' first analogy, the old garment was the legalistic system and the patch was the good news of salvation by grace, which by its very nature could not be added to works-based righteousness, apostate Judaism. Now, before we go on, I want us to think for a moment here. Pause. Jesus came to introduce the new, not patch up the old. And that's true whether we're talking about the old, corrupted, legalistic version of Judaism that he's confronting here, or the legitimate Judaism of the Old Testament. The first would be smashed by Jesus, and totally replaced. The second pointed to Jesus, and it would be fulfilled. Either way, the gospel of Jesus Christ did not combine with Judaism. It would destroy it or fulfill it. A new thing to replace it. It's like an acorn. You can get rid of an acorn in two ways. One, you can smash it with a hammer. That's what Jesus was doing with apostate, broken, messed up Judaism of his day. Just smash it with a hammer. Or the second way is to plant it. You plant it in the ground. Then what comes out of the ground? An oak tree. Do you still have the acorn? No. But it has been fulfilled, and it was the source, and it was the wellspring from which came the tree. Yeah, the acorn's replaced, but it's replaced with what it was intended to replace, be replaced with. And that's what happened to the old covenant. It gave birth to the new covenant. 
It was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. But here Jesus is confronting not the legitimate version of Judaism, but this broken and corrupted version of legalism. Now Jesus' second analogy echoed the same point. No one puts new wines into old wineskins. That's the analogy. Just like an unshrunk piece of cloth will destroy an old garment, so new wine will destroy old wineskins. Wine was stored in ancient Israel in containers made from leather, from animal skins. Often goat skins would be used, and the hide would be removed from the animal's carcass, and it was only cut around the legs and at the throat, the neck. Sometimes the hide would be, the cleaned hide would be turned inside out. The, the leg openings would then be show, sewn shut. And the wine would uh, uh, then be poured in and out from the neck. It would be used as a spout. Now, you put new wine in to a new, newly tanned leather goat skin. And as the wine would begin to ferment, it would produce gas. And it would expand, and it, they, the whole thing would inflate and blow up. And then as the process continued, then it would shrink back down. And then it would be fermented wine. Because it was a new wineskin, and it was elastic, the wineskin would do this expanding and contraction and no problem. But with an old wineskin, it would already be stiff and not stretchy anymore. So it would burst during fermentation if you put new wine in it. The wine would spill out and the flask would be destroyed. Like the first illustration, which demonstrated that the true gospel of grace cannot be attached to an old system of works-based righteousness, this analogy indicates that legalism of apostate Judaism cannot contain the message of salvation by grace through faith and not by works. In the same way that a patch is incompatible, a new patch is incompatible with an old garment and new wine is incompatible with old wineskins, the true gospel is antithetical to any system of salvation by works. Taken together, these analogies illustrate the exclusivity of Jesus' gospel. The utter hopelessness of any effort to combine it with anything else. The only true message of salvation is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which tells us that pardon from sin comes by grace alone through faith in him. Jesus' gospel is a gospel of grace. What, what that means is that God freely gives you what you don't deserve. And having received it, it ought to produce a joy in us saying, why me? Why did you give this to me? Instead of, well, that was a really good decision, God, because I'm just, you know, just right. No, no. Then you don't get it if that's your attitude. No, it should make you fall down in worship and adoration to him that you've been included. Well, if you think it through carefully, you will see that all the religions of the world and throughout the ages fall into the category of apostate Judaism. In that, they're all systems whereby a person progresses and ultimately escapes earth by doing good things, by conforming to some code. That is, all the religions of the world, around the world and throughout the ages, are works-based. For example, for, for Buddhists, to escape from continual rebirth, they must follow the Noble Eightfold Path. By following it, they earn their way to nirvana. Works. For Hindus to escape the cycle of uh, birth and death and rebirth and escape in, in, into the unimaginable abyss of Brahman, 
they must successfully follow one of four ways or paths or yogas they're called and they must do this through many reincarnations so that they progressively get better and better till they finally are successful and they reach their final salvation works right works for Muslims salvation depends upon a person's attitudes and actions and Islam presents a straight path of clear-cut duties and commands the Quran says in chapter 14 in chapter 17 verse 14 and listen to this think about this every man's actions we have hung around his neck and on the last day shall be laid before him a wide open book works and if you drill down into every religion worldwide and throughout the ages you will find a system of works righteousness by which humans seek to placate some deity by doing good things or by making the right sacrifice or by well works only in biblical Christianity does God reach down and do the work for us and give us eternal life as a free gift Anything else is a false gospel that leads us uh, not to heaven, but to hell. It's like taking water, putting poison in it. It kills. You can't take the gospel of grace and add works to it. It takes away its efficacy. So in an age where relativism reigns, we need to be reminded, and that's, that, that's, I think, what I'm doing today, is just reminding us of the exclusive nature of Jesus' gospel. It is unique. Instead of trying to build bridges of artificial unity with false religions, like ecumenism says to do, oh, well, let's just put aside our differences and find what we have in common, and let's just try to work. That's the process that is going to make the tribulation period the most religious time in world history. Religion won't be gone during the tribulation. It will be exploded, and it will be exploded as a single one-world religion led by a prophet and having a leader. And it'll get to the point where if you don't espouse that, if you espouse something unique, then you will be killed and officially hunted down by the government system. We don't need ecumenism. We need to preach the true gospel to people as they open the door when we knock on the door. Are you interested in spiritual things? Hmm, a little bit. Well, let's talk about it. As, as you knock on the door and they open, you push through, you walk through speaking the gospel of grace, of salvation by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That should be our urgent response to this awareness that Jesus' gospel is unique. It can't be combined with anything else. Jesus said, I am the way. Do, do you believe that? I am the truth. I am the life. No one. No one. The Greek, no, the Greek word for no means no. No. No one comes to the Father but through me. Okay. Well, pray with me. Lord, thank you for our time together. Thank you for your word, that it is true and right in every respect, that you have written a book and you have collected it together and you have preserved it for us and you've put it in our hands. Lord, may we take up your word with awesome respect 
and give it the honor that it deserves. And may we respond to its truth in the way that we ought to. Give us grace, Lord, the undeserved favor and your divine enabling to do and to believe and to embrace what is true and right and to exclude those things which are not. And then to reach out with love and compassion to those who are perishing uh, with the truth. Uh, give us boldness to do that. Give us the courage that it takes to do that. And we ask you in Jesus' name, amen.